So let me introduce you. Graham Adbain uh, spent the last few years of his career building open financial primitives and building communities in the open financial world. Uh, you are the community manager, manager of, of Move. IO, which is an open source community, uh, pretty new open source community, where you're doing amazing things. So welcome to our, Thank you. our session. Thanks. Um, I'm really thankful to be here. Um, I think the, you know, the, the early open web um, is really what set the standard for how the internet is today. And so it's just cool to be part of um, Apache Con and, and what we've done at Move is really in that vein. And so we're really thankful that you guys have set such a good example and are continuing to do so. So um, really thankful for the opportunity to talk to people and um, share a little bit more about me and, and what we're doing at Move. Um, so yeah, happy to happy to kind of take it away a little bit. Um, and maybe Javier, hopefully you can you can stick around and we can we can have a conversation and you can ask some more probing questions because you know. Um, me just talking for 40 minutes is less interesting than everybody uh, talking to us. So yeah, I guess I'll start. I'll give a little bit of background um, just on me and, um, and and then move. And then we could talk about the move community and, and what worked and what didn't. And then we could talk about, um, you know, what's happening now and most recently and then where, where we hope to take it in the future. Um, so yeah, so um, like you said, I've been working in the sort of finance and, and open source world for a while. Um, I first got into tech about 10 years ago. Um, and like everybody else, I benefited from open source software. So, so that was something that I always thought was really um, worthwhile to participate in. I, I don't know if you guys remember it's the, the 25 days of code, right? During, during the holiday season, people try and commit to code every day. So um, when I first got into code, I, I did that. Um, but you know, it's with everything open source, it's extremely hard to get committing going up and running from the very beginning. So uh, being being an open source committer is um, a difficult task. Um, but yeah, so uh, I've been an entrepreneur for most of my life. Um, I started a company many, many years ago um, for the iPhone. Um, so in most people don't remember, but the early days of the iPhone didn't even uh, take video. It was photos only. Um, and so my friends and I wanted to use iPhones as video cameras. And so we jailbroke them and um, we were doing, a, we were moped racing in the middle of California. And we found out a way that if we blanketed the track in Wi-Fi, um, we could we could jailbreak our iPhones and they could be set up as IP cameras so that we could um, live stream from these iPhones, which was actually like the best mobile camera that connected to Wi-Fi at the time. It just wasn't exactly what that was available. So we would duct tape iPhones to mopeds um, and then we were doing this live stream in 2012 where you had on track phones that were uh, sort of, we could switch between bikes on the track, which was really incredible at the time. Um, and most of that was sort of like the open source hacker community, which allowed you to do this. And it was really cool. Um, so eventually we built a hardware device that allowed you to put a lot of like camera gear on an iPhone, which at the time was really dumb because the cameras were bad. You know, Javier and I, you know, before this session started, we were talking about timing. Um, timing, right? Like right now, the iPhone camera that just came out for 13 is basically cinematic quality. So my product would have been great now, but um, I'm never going to do hardware again. But um, that experience taught me that hardware is extremely difficult and that every week a new iPhone app came out that sort of ate a piece of what our product did. And that made me realize that, oh, I should probably get into software. And so that's where I really started on the software journey. Um, started, you know, like a lot of people building websites for people doing that kind of thing. Um, and then I got into uh, a coding bootcamp, like one of the earliest coding bootcamps about eight years ago and really went in deep. And um, after I got out of that, I was a software engineer for a little while. And I learned that what I really liked doing was this, talking to people, educating people, sharing information. Um, and so I started doing events. Like the, the very first thing I did while I was still in coding school was a hackathon called um, Hack the Dot. And we got name.com to sponsor it. And the idea was you show up, we reveal a domain name, and then you've got two hours to build some kind of website that you might find at that domain name, which was super fun. So people people really enjoyed it. Um, 
and name.com said, hey, do you mind if we steal this format? And we're like, I was like, sure, please go for it. So now that's like the number one hackathon that they run. They go to colleges all over the country and run this domain name reveal hackathon, um, which was just such a cool like experience for me to realize that like my love of throwing parties and my interest in tech um, plus my sort of sense of humor could actually be a thing that that was valuable. Um, so yeah, so fast forward a little bit after working at a few uh, different roles as a, a developer advocate, um, I decided that it was time for me to start a company. And so um, again, talking about timing, I started working in the Ethereum network. So this was in um, 2018. So I started my company when Ethereum was here. And then like a few months later, Ethereum was here. Um, and that's just sort of how the nature of things go. But um, I was really lucky that I, I had got the bug so badly that I stuck around, right? I didn't just fold my company because price number go down. I stuck around because I really cared about what Ethereum means. And I think in a lot of ways, the open source world, um, the next sort of generation of that is the people who are really at the core of the blockchain infrastructure, right? Like um, there's nothing more open than a blockchain. And, um, and so the company that I was working on was storing geospatial data on chain in a public way. And you know, this is probably one of the few audiences that will actually care about the technicalities of this. But the idea was that um, if there's, you know, in this utopian society where we're all trying to build on Ethereum, right? If there's gonna be uh, an open and decentralized version of Uber, and there's gonna be a decentralized version of Google Maps and whatever, you need to have a decentralized mapping data store. You can't have all the data points on your map stored in Google servers or stored in Apple servers. It needs to be a, a single source of truth for geospatial data. And a good place to do that would be to have that data stored on chain. So we did a few really interesting technical things, which was um, there's a way to categorize geospatial data called quad keys, which is basically you take a flat version of Earth and that's the largest quad key. And then you split it into four smaller sections and those are smaller quad keys and so on and so on and so on. And so what you get is just a list of integers that tell you the position of anything on Earth. Um, and that's really important for the Ethereum network because updating integers on chain doesn't cost gas fees. And so that was a way that we could actually um, store information on chain and not incur gas fees. Um, I, I don't know if that's still the same way, but that's how Ethereum worked at the time. Um, and so it was really cool. And we, we built sort of the, the theory behind it was we've got this way to index and store geospatial data on chain that that is immutable so that um you know at the time there was something going on and i don't remember where it was now but um protesters were putting up hey we're going to meet at this place and then the government was making that app company take those location data data points down and so we gave that example of like these protesters could be posting things that couldn't be taken down um and that could even be like ngos who were trying to mark where you know, atrocities that are happening or something. And, and and then that couldn't be removed by the government. And so that was sort of our idealistic uh, vision for it. How we thought it could be valuable um, in the short term was as a sort of layer of truth for a, a world-based metaverse. Um, and again, timing, right? Like metaverses are so hot right now, uh, but in 20, yeah. 2018, they were not in the slightest. Um, and so that's where uh, that's where we went with it. Um, the concept was basically anybody could mint an NFT again early of one of the smallest quad keys, which was basically you know six foot by six feet of Earth's surface, and then um, they would be responsible for whatever data. Or they would not be responsible, but they could um, monetize any data that people wanted to put on there. So if you wanted to build like a you know a geocaching game with virtual objects. Um, you could, someone could say, hey, well, you can put that on my square and that would charge, you know? Um, and we had a lot of really interesting ideas about it. It was very adorable, but you know, it's it was a you developer could, tool. Own, Sorry? You can own the White House or you can own your, the, 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 the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we went to we went to ETH Denver and we handed out little business cards and you just scan the QR code on the back and you could claim the NFT of that. We basically gave away Denver at that conference, which was kind of fun. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a really cool idea. And the software is still open source because that's that's sort of who I am and, and what we believe. So 
Um, if anybody wants to create NFTs of Earth's surface, there's a library that's available for that. I don't know if anybody cares, but, um, and so we ended up, we didn't have any money. We were a bootstrap company, which was um, not for failure of trying. And there was another company that had raised a ton of money via ICO and they were interested in our technology and our engineering team. And so we got acquired by them, which was really cool. Um, and when I when I first got into software, I set a goal to, you know, sell a company that I wrote the first line of code for, and that technically achieved that goal. And that was six years into a decade of, of being in software. So I was really excited to have that outcome. Um, it turns out if anybody's ever read Edgar Allan Poe's The Monkey's Paw, like, careful what you wish for, right? Not every acquisition is a good thing. Um, in fact, most are not. But um, but it was a really incredible experience, and my team got to have an outcome, and and everybody got to like be. Um, everybody got to put in time and effort and get something back for it. And so that was just, I felt, I'm, I'm always incredibly proud that I was able to, to deliver um, for my team at that point. And then, um, so yeah, so we worked at that company for a while. Some of my team stayed a little longer than I did. Um, and then my, my next thing was um, in the Ethereum world or in the crypto world, um, we have this really silly dichotomy where people say like, we're for open banking and meet us at this next conference in, you know, Paris. And it's like, well, you know, if you want people to be for, you know, if you want to be for the world, but you're only going to like nightclubs in Paris to throw your conferences, IDK, I'm not sure if that's like the most inclusive scenario. So I created Remote CryptoCon, which is a fully remote um, conference and actually started it right before COVID. And then COVID happened and I looked like a genius. And so we had about a thousand people show up to Remote CryptoCon. Um, <laughs> timing. Timing, man. This, uh, this should be this talk should be called power of community timing. and timing um so you know remote cryptocon was great um got some of the best speakers in crypto because it was still crypto winter about a thousand people showed up to that event um and it, it was just really uh great to see people um assemble for learning about not like how to be moon kids but how to actually like learn the business of cryptocurrency um and it was around that time that i really was was dealing with this concept of all the marketing for cryptocurrency is, is terrible. Um, it's all about like buy some, it will go crazy and then you'll never have to work again. And we all know that like lottery winners all lose their money. So that's terrible marketing. And what I wanted to do was build a platform that sort of taught you financial literacy and then it could show you investment products because that's, that's really the path you should go on, right? Is like learn how to keep your piggy bank in order no matter how small it is and then learn how to invest your piggy bank when you have extra that led me to looking for how to like understanding banking as a service which is which is finally where move comes in i promise i'm getting there and uh and banking as a service is for those of you who don't know is basically the idea of um basically the idea that um if if you want to build a chime or a monzo or or any number of, of these neo banks that exist now um you don't have a bank charter but you're going to a bank and saying hey can we borrow your charter and they say sure um the sort of sticky part of that is that you need to have an agreement with the bank on what you can do and say to your customer and how much deposits you can make and there's just a whole lot of stuff that goes into that that isn't really covered um when you say find a bank partner um, the stickier part of that, and that Javier, you know very well, is that integrating to a core banking system is not exactly easy. Um, and and to yours maybe, but to you know the the those who shall not be named, large large four in the world, um, it's it's pretty impossible. You know they don't have APIs. If they do, they're SOAP. If they do, they're not documented. Um, and there's little to no support because the people that use them don't understand them. So it's so it's just as black box of a black box as you can possibly get of software engineering. Um, and so that was, for me, I immediately thought, okay, I'm not gonna go the route of finding my own bank partner. I'm gonna go and, and use one of these banking as a service providers. And what I found was that they are extremely expensive. Um, I got a quote from one of them and it was, oh yeah, just to get up and running, it's gonna be $25,000 a month. Um, and then, you know, if you wanna <laughs> add any kind of services, that's another $10,000 a month. And, and I was like, excuse me do you not is there a ramp up period you know do you have like a startup <laughs> pricing and they're like no that's it that's what the price is and so immediately um as imagine anybody else in that situation was due i googled 
open source banking as a service provider. Um, and that's what brought me to move. Um, I, I started looking around what, at what they were building and I realized two things. One, um, they were doing something really special, right? Like all the reasons I talked about how integrating with core banks is really difficult. They were trying to solve that. And two, um, there was no way I was going to be able to do this on my own, right? Like you need to have deep expertise to be able to navigate the banking system from a technical perspective. Um, and so that that was a big eye opener for me. And um, what happened then was I was sort of, I joined their community. Everybody was really welcoming. I followed them on Twitter. And then the CEO, Wade, posted, hey, we're hiring. They weren't hiring for a developer advocate or community role. Um, but I reached out and said, hey, here's me. Here's what I've been doing. I basically told him that whole story I told you guys, but in a LinkedIn message and shorter. And, um, and I was like, I love what you guys are doing. I would really love to work for you. And he goes, actually, we have a role that we haven't posted yet that would be perfect for, for exactly what you're talking about. So let's talk. Um, and so that's, that's really where I started with Move. Um, and, it, and it was really just the, the, perfect, the perfect timing. Um, I want to stop there really quick. Is there any, like, anything so, you want to be <clears throat> expand on or questions or yeah? So the, the, your role, it's 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 a uh, it's community and 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 open source are about communities. And back in the days the, when we were Mifos, we we had that role clearly. With of course Ed was playing that role and still playing that role. But now in in, in Apache, we don't have that role. And and in this, it is it's a real necessary role. How, how you can you explain? Pan more on, on on that role. What is what is what you do for the community and how you you do it? Yeah, um, I can absolutely expand on that. Um, and and a, basically, the the community is it's twofold. It's people that contribute and use our open source libraries, and people that are just interested, like I was, right? People that that know they want to build in fintech and need to get around. I have always said that community and, and developer advocacy are basically just um, like a resource switchboard where my job is to be the best resource on our planet Earth. Um, because you, people that are coming to open source projects, people that are joining a community are, are doing it to find people like them and answers. Um, and, and you just have to be able to give people answers as quickly as humanly possible. And, and in the way that they like finding them, right? Like um, video, uh, you know, text tutorial and one-on-one um, -on -one communication. And so whenever somebody joins our community, I send them a message that says, hey, welcome. Here's where to find our tutorials. Here is um, some other information. And here is my calendar link to book time with me. And I'll make any um, introductions, answer any questions you need. And, and the same thing always happens. People jump on that call and they say, um, please, you know, I'm sorry for asking all these silly questions, but, and I'm like, they're not silly questions. This is extremely valuable. If I get the same question three times, I write it down and that becomes a blog post. It's just, it's super valuable for me to have those interactions because I'm, I know what the people who join our community need. Um, and what's even more valuable is when you, people start joining later on and they're not asking questions that I've now answered in blog posts and other things. So I know that that stuff's working. Mm -hmm. So you are switch. I, I experienced from Frank Hell firsthand. I received that welcoming from you on the community and I book, a, um, I book a call with you and you put me in the right direction with uh, a huge valuable contacts that helped me a lot. So that's great. That's, I, I that's, wonder if I wonder if we can export that to the community uh, to a to app because it's an Apache and 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 everything everything is it's we are all volunteers and we need to find someone to step up and do the, this community work. So let's yes. talk about Move. So Move it's a it's a private company, but also you are, you manage and how is the relationship between the private company and the open source project? 
Yeah, it's really um, interesting. The it started as an open source project, not a company. So um, it started because Wade had been successful and had a few exits. And so he was mentoring companies at Techstars and investing in startups. And he would write them a check and they would say, we're gonna do all this really cool fancy stuff for users. And then they would come back six months to a year later and say, we need more money. And he'd be like, well, what did you build? And he's like, well, we've been trying to figure out ACH this whole time. Um, and so he was sick and tired of sort of uh, lighting his money on fire. Uh, for people trying to solve the same problem. And he was like, I can solve this for people. And so he got one of his engineers from a, from a previous company and said, let's fix this for people. And specifically what we do is um, most people on this call may or may not know that the ACH, ACH is a file format. It's not anything other than that. So, and if you didn't have the move libraries and you wanted to convert the data in your application into an ACH file, you would have to go to a bank and they would say, yeah, just give us an ACH file. And then they would give you a PDF from NACHA that says, here's all the guidelines, figure out how to code this and to turn your JSON into ACH. And then and then you just go blow your brains out and start crying because of what a ridiculous thing. You know, in the modern age of software, what a crazy concept. Um, and so Wade and Adam just thought, well, why don't we do this as a library? And so that's what the ACH library does. It's a um, it's, a, it's written in Go, so if you use Go, you can just include it as a package and use it. Um, if you don't use Go, then you can, um, we've got a Docker image, so you can just deploy it and then use it as an API endpoint in your own system. And so you send it your JSON, it sends you back a compliant Nacho file, and you can hand that off. And we do that for a bunch of other stuff like wires, debit card messages, um, the Metro 2 credit reporting format, and, um, and a bunch of other stuff. So, so we've got a ton of different of these standards that it is not a differentiator for any company, um, but it's something that every fintech has to deal with. Um, so that was the initial seed of the project. Um, Wade sort of had this initial concept that um, we could be like Red Hat, where uh, if somebody wanted to use these open source libraries, but they didn't want to deal with the SOC 2 compliance and all that, we could run a managed services version of that. Um, and it turns out nobody really wanted that because it still meant understanding and implementing with um, the open source or understanding and implementing ACH. And so what we're building now is a really high level abstraction on top of these open source libraries, but we're still making these available. Um, cool things that have happened with the libraries. Um, there's a company that, that I can't name uh, that's in the cannabis space that was getting paid or getting charged 3% per ACH transaction because they're in a high risk category, um, which if you know that payment space is highway robbery. Um, it is, so their head of payments came around and looked at Move and saw our open source uh, projects and thought, hmm, six months of engineering time is, you know, much less than a year of 3% ACH fees. And so they implemented our ACH library with their bank partner, and now they're paying 50 cents per ACH, which is, you know, an order of magnitude cheaper than what they were paying before. Um, and so they're saving tens of millions of dollars a year using our open source libraries because they were getting robbed. Um, uh, yeah, Alexander, that's a really good question. Um, and I will, I'll, I'll, I'll just jump on that now if that's okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. yeah, so um, validating our implementations against the standards like ACH. Um, yeah, so the specs are all available. Um, but the worst part about payments is that specs is sort of a, a funny, fuzzy term. Um, those specs, like I mentioned, are in, an, in a uh, PDF, but um, not everybody follows them and not everybody follows them in the same way. And so that's also where um, the open source project becomes really powerful. And it's actually the, the next example I was talking about. So this is a perfect segue. Um, timing. Welcome. Um, Welcome to the financial industry where there's no standards. <laughs> Right, this, it's everything's made up, and all the points and the points matter a lot. Um, so that's like the opposite of that game. Um, so yeah, um, there. So everybody does it differently. Everybody deals with ACH differently. Everybody generates ACH files differently. Even within single financial institutions, they may have different core providers and different implementations of those core providers. And so the files that they generate will be totally different. And so it's total insanity. Um, and then just to top the cherry off, when you send your ACH file to the clearinghouse um, or the Fed, 
uh, if there's something wrong with it, they'll just give you get random error codes back that don't that you have to figure out and interpret. And some they won't even send you a full pot file back. You'll send them a file full of payments that need to go out, and they'll send you back three payments, and sometimes with an error code and sometimes not. And so you just have to guess why those were wrong. Um, so basically what that translates to in, in code speak is edge cases. The edge cases are enormous and insane uh, when it comes to ACH, um, even if you're you're dealing with standards. And so where the open source project comes in is you when you have a bunch of people using this library, you get to see all the edge cases and you get to account for them, which is really, really sort of incredible. Um, one thing that's that's been on our mind is um, in the healthcare space, there are things in ACH called addenda records. They're little added pieces of data you can add to your ACH file. And the healthcare world has their own addenda records. And so if we can add the healthcare specific addenda records to our ACH project, then a lot of healthcare payments can become a lot more automated. So that's something that um, if people are interested, we're actively looking for contributions and um, feedback on, on how to prioritize that. But anyway, the example I wanted to talk about, Alexander, was um, one of the big four banks who shall not be named came to us and said, hey, we want to, you know, train a machine learning model on our ACH payments. And we want to historically look back at all the payments that we've sent and understand, you know, which ones did and didn't fail and why they did and didn't fail so that we can have a more streamlined process moving forward. And so they used, they took billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of payments and the payment files from historically and ran them through our ACH library to generate JSON. And then they used that JSON as a normalized data set to train their uh, machine learning model. But in the process of doing that, they found an extreme number of edge cases that we wouldn't have found in like a hundred years otherwise, because you know the volumes that had gone through the, the library were nowhere near what went through in just that set. Um, and then they pulled, I think like 150 bug reports on the open source projects and committed a few um, answers. And so now this library is extremely hardened because we've got all of these edge cases that, that were dealt with. So Alexander, I think that's like the longest answer to a question ever, but um, yes, there are standards. Um, nobody follows them. Um, and But the cool part about using an open source project is you get to actually um, deal with edge cases because you have people from all over the world that are using them in all kinds of different ways. So just really, really thankful that um, we have that. Next question, it's all over the world. Are you focused on all over the world or it's America first, your focus? <laughs> well, I'm not gonna fall Sorry into that. that. I'm not gonna fall into that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, ISO, um, we 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 do hope to to go all over the world, right? Um, we think that this is a problem everywhere, um, and we want um, one problem that I recently came up with. That's a big thing. I want to try and get the time and energy to deal with is international wires. If you um, even worse than the PDF is international wires. So if you want to send a wire between this country and that country. Um, one of the big four accounting companies will sell you a PDF for $500,000 that says, here's how to format those wires. And just like the free PDF you get for ACH, it doesn't actually have any of the right answers. Um, and a friend of mine who works at a, another big bank said they were on a call with 20 people from each of these two banks because a huge wire, like huge, huge wire didn't go through correctly. Um, and it was a big problem. And he's like, there were 20 people from each team on the call, which meant there were hundreds of people at each side of that bank that are uh, in each bank that were furious that this didn't go through. So you can imagine the dollar amount. Um, and he goes, you guys should really generate, you guys should really work on a library that um, you just give it the two countries that you want to send the wire to in between and the you know account information. And it spits you back a compliant international wild wire file format. And, and bonus is that you get to destroy the value of a $500,000 PDF. And so like, I'm on fire with wanting to do that. So um, yes, we, we really want to do that. We obviously need to sort of do one thing first, which is conquer the US market and in being able to provide this stuff. Um, but yeah, I think next step, I think it's it's ISO 2022. I know, uh, James, you mentioned it here. I haven't read that question fully yet, but um, that 
the RTP standard is really what everyone hopes becomes the next international payment rail. Um, and that's something that we're actively working Which on one? and contributing to. RTP standards? The ISO <clears throat> 2022, I think, is the... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe we can go to James' question. So, yeah, let me, um, let me go ahead. Maybe related to standards and where things are at, ACH systems are in place in many countries, many funded by the World Bank in the 70s and 80s, and they are now migrating to ATS plus concepts, some of which are IIPS, Instant Immediate Payment System. So wondering if you're going to go after most of the legacy ACH system first, and then the ATS or IIPS underlying protocols, or some other direction, SEPA or ISO 20. 222. 222. <clears throat> yep. Um, yeah. So, as far as as far as I know, and as far as like the the research that we've spoken about, um, you know, ACH, <clears throat> it's like fifty five trillion dollars a year in the U.S. Um, and a lot of that is still fifty five trillion a year goes over ACH <laughs> in the United States. A year. Which is a year. Um, and a huge amount of that is we we talk to companies that have spreadsheets. And they have an ACH file, and they have someone whose whole job is taking a spreadsheet and hand coding an ACH file, and and like checking it for typos and sending it off to the bank. And that is a much bigger section of those fifty five trillion dollar payments than anybody wants to admit. So like, there's a lot of room to grow there. Um, but to the point, James, I absolutely um, we we see a lot of people that are talking about um iso 2022 and for everything we can tell that really is going to be the standard that a lot of people are talking about that a lot of people are working towards and so we've done a ton of work on it we have an iso 2022 um library and so you can actually start using it and contributing to it now so we'd absolutely love if people wanted to to um be part of that but but um we definitely think that that's it's a more modern payment format it's international first. I think there's a lot of value in it. Um, the hard part about all of these new payment standards, which I'm sure all of you sort of know intrinsically, is like ACH is only universal because the federal government said, hey, we're going to start paying Social Security via ACH. And so every bank in the country said, all right, looks like we need to start accepting ACH or we're going to lose our Social Security clients. And so there's going to need to be some sort of forcing function that makes mm -hmm banks adopt this stuff. The big five banks have already adopted RTP. Great. But, you know, how many people are going, I'd really like to send my, my sister money over RTP. Like the, nobody, that's not how consumers work. And that's not how, um, you know, commercial customers work, um, even though it's an instant and, and great. Um, so they're going to need to be some kind of forcing function to make ISO 2022 work. Um, but even for us and our business, it's valuable for us to have it work because it's a better customer experience if people are getting their money instantly and not um, multiple ways. Um, Anas, how do you contribute to the project? Um, I'll share the link in here. And thank you. Um, so there's our library. There's our, our main GitHub. You can see all of our um, libraries and stuff there. So yeah, um, you know, I think we were talking about Move and the open source project and how we're, we're building the new um, high level stuff. Maybe I could talk about like the community at Move and how yes. it started in the early days and, and what worked and what didn't. Um, so when I joined the community, we had about 300 people in it. Um, it was just a Slack channel. It was just, you know, Wade and Adam. Um, and they were doing a lot of things right. Um, so Javier, we talked about the personal welcomes. So Wade was personally welcome every person that joined. Um, we're now, you know, 55 people and we got funded by A16Z. And so like Wade doing that is probably not his highest and best use. So that's what I do now. Um, they also welcome everybody that joined in the past week. And um, and that was a big way to just say to people like, hey, I saw you one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, here's all the other people that you're working on. Um, let's do a few, let's do a few things together. Um, and so I really took that on. One thing that I decided to do early on was not add any automation to our Slack channel. Um, I've been in a lot of communities and a lot of Slack and Discord channels where there are bots. And I just don't, it doesn't feel good, right? Like 
I'm someone who really likes to throw parties. I love hanging out with people and helping people. That's why I'm good at my job. Um, and a bot helping or trying to start conversation just feels disingenuous. And so, you know, we're now a 2,500 person Slack channel and I still hand welcome everybody to the community. I still do all the posts um, automatically, but that's, it's a big deal. Cause if you join a Slack channel and your, your Slack name isn't your first name, um, I as a human um, are, I was, as a human can tell and sort of welcome you by your first name. And I can look at your background and sort of talk to you about what you've done. Um, and I just think that that's so valuable and it makes people feel welcomed and seen. Um, when I was, so you, when you, I was your main, your main community channel is Slack. Mm -hmm. You don't have yep. like mailing list or other, other. We, we have a monthly newsletter now where we share news from the Slack channel. Um, every once in a while, there's it's these... like outboard. It's like, a, 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 it's you're sending a message, but not like the, the, the Apache communities that everything it's around the uh, mailing list. And this being, uh, 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 it's part of the community discussion and it's being um, the Apache ways, it's everything is in on list. So we can't do anything that out, 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 it's not in the list because it's how we, we work. So um, and a remote and open source community uh, appreciates the, 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 um, the, the, the mailing quality, the, the, the non-linear, the non-instant messaging, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, I can't find the word, but. Oh, um, you, uh, uh, asynchronous. Yeah. asynchronous. Asynchronous, yeah. Exactly, asynchronous message. Yeah, that's that's actually a big thing we're working on um, <clears throat> because part of, part of the problem with Slack is it doesn't save messages over 10,000, right? Um, and that's that's a problem. And, and we have these great conversations and interactions that don't get saved. And so we're trying to build an asynchronous um, store of questions and answers. And so what we're using for that is GitHub discussions, <clears throat> which have been extremely valuable for us. So GitHub discussions are something you could turn on on any repo and it's just like a Q and A section and people can upvote questions and answers. And, and that's a really valuable sort of permanent asynchronous data store. Um, that's something that I think is, is going to be more important for us moving forward. Um, and so we do think that's valuable. We don't have a sort of Apache style mailing list. Um, we do have a one to many newsletter that, that we just send out. And I do, I try and do a really good job of um, soliciting information from the community and then com communicating it out. <clears throat> it's not just a newsletter of move updates. It's a newsletter of requests that people have put out in the community job posts that people have put out in the community. Um, and what I'd like to do is find really interesting interactions and share that. So somebody in our community asks like, hey, how do you, um, how do you categorize deposits or how do you build a model that recognizes what deposits into a user's bank account are from their payment or from their company? Um, we're trying to build a model to do that. And the, the head of engineering, the previous head of engineering at Monzo with the largest neobank in Europe said, oh, we built a model to do that. Um, let me help. And I'll jump in your DMs and I'll help you figure that out. And it's like, you just short circuited a year and a half in millions of dollars in engineering time by, by getting that person to give you that answer. So um, really incredible. And I like to sort of screenshot those conversations and share them because I think it's it's powerful to people to see that um, others are helping. Yeah, Justin. Justin, I feel for you about scaling your support. It's hard. Sorry, <laughs> Javier. Go ahead. So we have a. It, it is. It's following the same with Mifos community and Slack, and it's having the same. I think that we address that. The, the searchability of Slack. It's unless you pay, but paying. It's so much money. For, yeah, twenty five hundred. It's 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 a lot of money. Yeah, one, one thing we're um, looking at actively this quarter and we'll probably develop an exporter, if we do, of course, it'll be open source, is building a Slack to GitHub discussions bot. So if there's a great thread in Slack, you can just tag the bot and it'll save that conversation and post it to GitHub discussions as a, as a discussion. Um, 
Yeah. So if, if we figure out when we figure that out, um, we'll definitely open source it. Cause I think it's a problem that a lot of people have and um, it's extremely valuable. Another thing we want to work on is getting when there's actions on GitHub issues, whatever that happen, getting those posted to a Slack channel. There is an integration for that already. That's just something that we want to do. Um, so yeah, they all good. Go well, still has some advantages of of over Slack. Yeah, every every there's there's more than one way to build a community, right? Um, oh. It's just what what works for your team. There's a really great tool that I I recommend to a lot of people who are just starting their community. Um, it's called Luma. If we were starting from scratch, we would use Luma. It's basically everything you need in a box. It's a um, asynchronous data store of questions and answers. It's a messaging service. It's a ability to host live and virtual events. Um, and it's got like a, a news feed, like message board so that people can post. It's really incredible and it's free. Um, so super, super valuable tool. Thank you. Okay, Graham, I know if there is any more community. Um, uh, Victor, is there any information about the MOOC project talking about integrations with Fineract or PROSA in Mexico? It's something we've we've talked about. Ed, Ed and I have, have um, we've got some, I know we've got some conversations going. I'm, I just threw a conference and that was, uh, took up all of my time, but, um, I think we talked about there being a use case and um, for interacting with the two. Our projects are open source, Victor. So, you know, feel free to join our Slack channel and message me directly. Um, and you can also just email me. Um, and uh, if it's something that's valuable to you, we prioritize stuff as the community requires it and, and requests it. Um, I think, you know, Ed, Ed had spoken that um, Finteract and could use our payment libraries. And so if that's possible, then we'd love to have those interactions. The more open source stuff, the more open source functionality, the better. We do get a lot of international people that are asking, how do I use this? And you know, if they can um, spin up a core that has payment functionality you know, piped into it, that would be extremely valuable. My, my goal is that it's, you have as much, you can, use payment networks all over the world as easily as you can use, you know, a paid service in any one of those countries. I think that um, we have the power to do that as a community and um, it's a worthy goal. I get people from, from all over the world that, that come to me and say, this is, and they explain sort of how their payments work and it's just crazy, right? Like in a lot of places in Africa, it's, it's owned by the telecom company. And it's a totally closed private network and they have just an utter monopoly on how payments work. And it's like, we need to be able to build open source systems that are, that are better than that. Okay. Yeah. And with that message, we are almost in time or of, out of time. Now our next session will start in five minutes. Uh, and so, thank you, Raham. Uh, we love you to have. We love to have you here, and 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 hopefully we can we can do great things together. We have two great communities that we are working in the same space, and and we are very complementary. So we we can achieve things together. Yep. Yeah. No. I'm I'm really thankful for you guys reaching out and and joining the community. Um. I think I think it's uh, a big opportunity for us to democratize access to infrastructure, um, which is a term that we should put people to sleep, but it's, it's the best things put people to sleep. So let's, let's do mm. it and make it good for everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Um, Ed, does Luma handle community identity profiles? Not outside the platform, but yes. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Okay. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.